Hi, I'm an Australian guy living here in Belarus. And of course, as you would imagine, there are a lot of big cultural differences between uh, life in Belarus here and uh, life in Australia. And of course, when I say life in Belarus, I kind of mean Eastern Europe. And when I say life in Australia, I kind of mean life in the West, right? Because they're obviously more related. But there's some really simple stuff as well. Simple regulatory things that are very, very different. First of all, here in Minsk in particular, these electric scooters are so incredibly popular. They are literally everywhere. You just have to look around there. There's another one up there. And pretty much wherever you go, there will be these little e-scooters everywhere. And people use them a lot. They're very popular. And people, when they get on them, they really, oh, 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 it's like a video game, the way they weave in and out of the traffic. And obviously here you can see a nice, big, fat, wide footpath. That makes things a lot easier to get around in, but still there are accidents. But here, it seems that people have the right to choose their own destiny on some level. Whereas in Australia, uh, the government says that no, uh, this is dangerous. And okay, you can have some fun, which you'll miss out on. But if you run into people, that's not cool. So we're going to ban these. So I know in the city of Sydney, these things are banned. Second thing that's very interesting is just the use of seatbelts. So having grown up in Australia and spent most of my life in Western countries, when I get into a, a, a Yandex taxi, which I'm sure there'll be one along here somewhere, well, there's a police car, that's about all. But if I get into a Yandex taxi, I will just put the seatbelt on. And if I'm with uh, Belarusian people, they often remark, why did you put the seatbelt on? Are you worried about the driver or something? Do you think he's been drinking or something? What, what's happening, right? I'm like, oh no, it's just a habit. In fact, it's a habit because in Australia, it's illegal not to. You'll get fined, and I'm pretty sure the driver is responsible. Um, so we just put the seatbelt on. And the reality is the seatbelt can be useful, especially um, when you're going at high speeds on a, a non-split road like this one. See, it's not split, so it's, there's some chance of a head-on rather than having a, a gap in between the, the two directions. Um, but if you're going slow speeds, I mean, you know, nothing much is going to happen, right? So... Anyway, here in Belarus, you can put the seatbelt on if you like. If you don't like, then don't put it on. It's a pretty obvious difference. Another thing uh, are helmets. So what you'll see in Australia is that you have to wear a helmet when you ride a bicycle, for example. So if you ride a bicycle around somewhere, and I'm sure there'll be someone ride past the next few minutes, um, you have to wear a helmet. If you don't, you can be stopped and fined for not wearing a helmet. Whereas here in Belarus, I tell you what, I've seen a lot of these things go around, right? A lot of these and a lot of bicycles. I have never seen a helmet. Never, not one. The idea of the light kind of, that's that polystyrofoam, whatever stuff it is inside the helmet, this, this kind of helmet doesn't exist here. The only time I've seen anyone wear a helmet was a guy who was on a Segway. I saw him yesterday, he was on a Segway and he had like a full motorcycle helmet on. So you see this guy go past here? Of course, uh, no helmet, wouldn't consider it. Doesn't really know what it is. It's not a narrative here. What would you wear a helmet for? It's not a motorbike. That would be the attitude um, that someone would give if I asked them why they're not wearing a helmet. So these little subtle things, and these kind of reflect the culture a little bit. You know what I mean? Like you know that these surface issues, if you will, surface topics, surface policies, what have you, you know that they do reflect uh, deeper cultural beliefs and so on. So here in Belarus, there's more of a self-determination. It's up to you, you idiot, do whatever you're going to do. Whereas in Australia, it's like, well, no, uh, the government knows better than you do, so you should uh, do what we say. And of course, there's some merit in both sides, right? Depends what's going on, but there's, there's pros and cons to both sides. It's kind of interesting to see this difference. Because look, I'm not too keen in going along uh, a, a highway, going 130 kilometers an hour as Belarusians like to drive at, and with traffic going the other direction, one meter away from me. I mean, obviously it doesn't really matter that speed, what happens if you have a seatbelt or not, but you know what I'm saying. I'd quite like to have one on, but to be honest, I don't put them on that much now. I've kind of got out of the habit a little bit, uh, unless, again, we're gonna go higher speeds or something, then I'll put them on, but it's just one little, example, one surface level example of what you might notice if you're here just for a short time here in Minsk. And again, I'll finish the video with our beloved e-scooter here, which is 
absolutely iconic here. Absolutely iconic. You might find 20 of these lined up outside the average train station and they're incredibly popular. You'll often see a boy and a girl together. So they'll put the girl, she'll stand here at the front and the guy will be here at the back and he'll be steering over her shoulders. You see this very regularly and then they're going uh, 30 kilometers, 35, even 40 kilometers an hour sometimes on the footpath. So you can see how this might end with a problem at some stage. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, give me a thumbs up. It tells me that you enjoyed the content. It gives me some encouragement. It tells me what to make more of in the future. If you are subscribed, I do thank you. If you're not, why not? You got a finger, just go for it. Press the subscribe button right now. Because this is a short video, what I'll do is I'll turn the camera around and I'll go for a bit of a walk and we can have a bit more of a general chat about things. Hey guys, got some bonus footage for you. I thought that video was a little bit short, so I'm gonna go for a stroll. I'm actually just walking home. I've been filming up and around near Namiga here, and I'm going to turn around and walk south along the river. Near Zabitskaya. I'll have a little bit of a chat. I am a bit fatigued because I've been filming maybe seven or eight videos in a row, so the brain's a little bit mushy at the moment, but I'll have a bit of a chat with you as we go under the bridge here. So if you're in Minsk, you'll no doubt know this area. This is kind of the most central area, really, I think. There is, quote unquote, the centre, but it hasn't quite got the same density. It's a bit more spread out, the centre. Whereas here in uh, Namiga, Zavitskaya area, especially in Namiga, it's more of a concentrated uh, kind of place. A lot more people. Um, it's about, I don't know what the time is, three or four in the afternoon. So you can tell there, the young boy with his mother. So after school, maybe 3.30 or 4. So pretty light for traffic around. I'll make my way up here. What you will notice is a lot of bicycles. It's kind of rental bicycles and also rental scooters. Pretty cool little uh, storage for bikes here. If you have your own private bicycle, you want to lock it up. I tell you what, there's few countries in the world where you wouldn't want to lock up your bike, but this is one where you could probably get away with just leaving your bike there unlocked. I reckon uh, if you left your bike there unlocked for a day, I reckon there'd be a 90% chance that it's still there at night time. And although my country of Australia, my city of Melbourne, is not particularly uh, high crime, I can guarantee you that bike would not be there <laughs> at the end of the day. That's certain, for sure and certain. Um, you notice that guy who just whizzed past on the electric scooter. This is very common. People really, although Belarus is a very polite, civil and orderly kind of society, you do see them on the e-scooters, they really just go whoosh, 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 whoosh. So this, like it's a video game sometimes. I'm surprised there's not more accidents. I've never really seen an accident with e-scooters. Um, but of course there would have to be some. A buddy of mine fell off his the other day came off and scraped his hand. Bruised it pretty badly, actually. It was, I saw him about a week after he did it, and his hand was still pretty blue, pretty red. It's a big, big church. So I walked down here, and I'll try to get onto the river path and away from the bars. This is kind of the bar area. I don't head this down this way too much. I'm not really a bar kind of guy, not really my scene. Uh... That's where it is. Someone just said a little bit, not to me. Um, that's the Bitskaya Street, which you'll probably know if you're a foreigner. Tends to be kind of more like your touristy bar strip. But what we'll do is we'll take the river home, because I live kind of fairly close to here, so I'm just going to walk home. And I figure while I'm walking home, I might as well uh, let you join me if you want to come for a stroll. So I do recognise the lack of footage coming out of Belarus. So let's chuck some here. You know, I quite like watching street walking videos. It's definitely part of my travel preparation routine, my travel research routine. You can really soak up the feel of a city. Where's busy? Who lives there? What they're doing? Sort 
sawing going on here. So we'll go down onto the kind of bike slash walking path here. Get here and we'll turn right, head back out towards the north of the city. It's a nice big river here, have a bit of a look here. Just do my best not to cause a collision. People walking around. That's kind of headed south, I guess. And the Mega, nice big wide river here. When I say nice, you probably wouldn't go in and drink the water, but you know. We have an organised path here, walking on this side, and bicycles going on the right side as usual. Everything here is on the right side. Of course, Australia is the other ones out, or are the other ones out, and we do everything on the left side. Walk and cycle and drive on the left side. Looks like they're doing a bit of renovation work there. The guy's sawing something down below there, sawing off some rust or something. Here's someone else with a saw up there somewhere. So that guy that just went past there, on the Yandex, you can see the go in the back there. So he's a delivery bike rider and I'm sure you'll know this if you live in a fairly dense city. If you live like out in an American town, you probably haven't even seen this before maybe. Um, but if you live in a fairly dense area, you would have seen these, no doubt, in your country. Uh, as is everything at the moment, everything's kind of global. So whenever something comes out of usually the States, it kind of goes everywhere. And that's one example, that kind of local food delivery business. That one's through Yandex. Yandex is, well, it's kind of everything in this part of the world. It's, it competes with Google in terms of browsers and search engines and maps and so forth. But also competes with Uber. Although I think it bought Uber out in this part of the world. I could be wrong. I forget what happened with that. But you have a lot of consolidation in that industry in the last few years. In the ride-sharing industry. Pretty sure if you download the Uber app here, it just redirects you to the Yandex app. More apartments being built. It's really interesting with the apartments and houses situation in Belarus because I guess like everywhere in the world, especially in a place like Belarus that has this low birth rate, which pretty much every European country has, the population is shrinking slowly, you know. Um, in addition to that, you've got this kind of insatiable appetite to move from the village and the smaller city to bigger cities. So you have a lot of abandoned houses in Belarus, abandoned villages. And uh, yeah, young people here, they might inherit their grandparents or grandmother's kind of village house, but it really has no value because no one wants to buy it. I mean, it might be in a village of 100 people, but 30 of the houses are already empty and you know, give it another 20 years, they'll all be empty, you know? There's, there's literally no value to it. In these kind of regions, all the value is in the building, which you can usually pull apart. Pull apart the building pretty easily. Young people want to migrate to the city for economic purposes. Economic being both in terms of work and production, but also consumption as well. It's certainly the trend of the modern era, or the recent era, should we say. So you've got all these kind of emptying out villages. I've spent a bit of time out in these places too. I like to visit out there. You really are, it's mainly babushkas, but I really like the scenery and I really like get a sense of history and lifestyle and stuff so going out to the really remote places is quite a uh, desirable activity for me so I've seen quite a lot of these places where they're just empty I haven't released much of the footage I made heaps of it but I made it all before I got a gimbal so a lot of the camera works really shaky and you see even now I've got old footage that I'm trying to use but it's kind of shaky but I'm using it anyway uh, in moderation but yeah, I've been in situations where I've found little towns and little villages and literally no one lives there. But after a year or two, if no one claims the house, the government pulls the house down and it ends up just farmland again, basically. That's what you see. A lot of people, uh, when their grandparents die, they just start using uh, the house either as a dacha, as a summer house, and or some kind of uh, maybe, well, I've seen raspberries being grown, honey, that 
abandoned village I found the other day down near uh, Legation, just north of Pinsk. Um, a lot of honey being grown, a lot of bee houses uh, being grown down that way. So you kind of got this reverse development, it's really interesting. So throughout the last hundred years, certainly in Australia, you have the demolition of green areas and uh, agricultural areas and they're replaced by housing whereas Belarus it doesn't have that big influx of migration like Australia does are doing the opposite uh, apart from Minsk of course and some of the other bigger cities but all the other smaller towns and stuff are just shrinking and they're turning their houses into little agricultural plots it's like reverse evolution uh, in a sense and you see all of a sudden that the land just has no value. I, I was staying in a house in, uh, when I say a house, I mean a friggin' suburb of a house. Like, I think it had seven bedrooms, three bathrooms. I, I rented it for like 12 US dollars a night, right? This is out in a small town uh, called Legation. It was the same town, actually. And it was $12 a night, but it was literally, I think in total, like 12 rooms a big dining hall and then multiple buildings and the, the, the block itself must have been 100 by maybe 300 meters multiple buildings whatever and the lady who owned it said they paid 50,000 for it pretty recently like that's crazy and it's like all the value is in the building like, the land itself has literally no value whereas if you're from a growing western city you're used to the opposite being true the building has limited value. Of course, it depends, right? If you're in an apartment block, that's different. But if you're in just kind of a normal house, especially an older house, all the value is uh, in the in the land, right? And very little in the building. Especially if you've got some good land inside of a large capital city, large city that's kind of growing in terms of population. Uh, this is what's happening. Whereas, yeah, here in Belarus, it's kind of hard to get your head around. In Minsk, it's different, but. Uh, also, you know, Gomel and Bresk, Grodna, Mogulov, Teps, a few others. Once you get outside of these, uh, that's what's happening. Places are shrinking. You've got that low birth rate, which again is very typical of ex-Soviet countries. You don't see any ex-Soviet countries with a high birth rate, that's for sure. Never. They're just shrinking. And uh, the birth rate in Belarus isn't terrible. But what's interesting in Belarus, like it has a similar birth rate to America. What's interesting is that in Belarus, almost every woman has a child. But then they just stop at one or two. Whereas in America, it's even like a quarter of women don't have children. Whereas in Belarus, it's like 7% or something. So although they have a similar birth rate, in Belarus, they have less children per woman because more women have children. But again, just one or two. Like you almost never see three children in a family. Never. Almost never. Whereas in America, you have kind of a quarter of women not having children. which is an extraordinary figure. Extraordinary. But, of course, there's countries with even higher non-birthing rates. There was someone I read the other day that had 40% of women not having children. It's like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> like, how can you have a civilization where no one's having children? Like, we've just lost sight of the very basics to keep a civilization going. We have all this great technology and sexy new gadgets. We don't have any bloody kids. It's remarkable. It might have been Korea. So I see that Korea's birth rate is less than half of what it needs to be to sustain its population. So in other words, throughout a generation, Korea's um, population will go down by about 60%. It's crazy stuff. So yeah, in America, about 27% of women don't have kids, which means the ones that do have kids are actually having more than two on average. And we know this is linked entirely to almost entirely to market economy education now i'm not saying education i'm saying market economy education because the education that we refer to as education is very narrow in scope it's how to prepare you to contribute and take out of a market economy of course we can educate people in all kinds of things but at the moment we don't we uh, educate in terms of economy so yeah you have women who have children in america have often two or more, but a lot of them don't have any children, whereas in Belarus, women typically have one or two children, but almost every woman has a child or two. So it ends up being the same average per person. That's kind of interesting there, but 
The trend, of course, globally is for women to have either no children or children later. And this will just increase. I don't see how this turns around, to be honest. So one of the more interesting problems that we face as a, as a globe, as a civilization, if you will, as a society, as a group of animals that are humans, is what do we do in that space? Because at the moment, it's only headed one way, that we're going to be really rich financially, but have no people and have very little connection with other people. Because, of course, what goes with that is that we don't feel connected with people, right? And that's what you see around the world as well. <clears throat> people not feeling as connected with other people around them. I saw a survey of uh, American men, uh, and it said that in the 1960s, the average American man said that... Uh, or the, so the median American man, median... I won't explain the difference, average and median, but uh, it's not that important. The essence of what I'm saying is more important. Uh, so the median man said that he had, on average, five good friends. That's pretty good. Uh, but 50 years later, just recently, the same survey was conducted, and the median man had zero good friends. So less children, less good friends, means there's a lot less social connection at the moment. So this is a trend of people separating. That beautiful river here. You can see those autumn leaves slowly turning yellow and brown and falling down. On this side as well. See them on the ground. They're very organized here. They have uh, people come around and scrape them up and clean them up. So this won't be on the ground for very long. Before you know it, there'll be a whole lot of uh, piles of leaves. An outdoor gym here. Very popular for the young guys. I'll try and go still and get a good sense of what's going on there. So anyway, all that conversation was all coming back to the, uh, I guess, migration, intra-nation migration, rural to urban, and the changes in demand for property and so forth. So you can kind of see a time in the future, again, in, in this trajectory, actually I'll finish off on the birth rate thing. I mean, it's difficult to see that changing. You have governments around the world absolutely bribing people to have kids. Well, the financial incentives in place are incredible because the number one reason people say they don't have kids is because they can't afford it, which, quite frankly, isn't really true because when you look inside of a country, the lower your income is, the more kids you have. And the higher your income goes, the less kids you have. So I don't really buy this whole we can't afford kids thing. Of course, at the very top, the wealthiest, well, they still have a fair bit of kids, but outside of that, in America, for example... I don't have the exact data in front of me, but you know, if you're on 25,000 or less, you have about, say, 2.5 kids on average. And that drops all the way up to, say, 250,000, 300,000. It's like one kid or 1.1 kid per woman. And then suddenly it jumps up again for the people that are genuinely wealthy, people, you know, over 500,000 income or whatever. Because that's a lot of money, right? I mean, it's, you're either, yeah, you're probably just wealthy at that point. It's not to do with your profession, it's to do with. Uh, created wealth from business or inherited wealth or whatever. So yeah, the long-term trend in terms of uh, living looks like we'll pretty much all live in the city. And I'm aware, yes, there is a counter-trend, obviously, that started with COVID, that people want to live in a more rural environment, but the net flows are still very much city-bound. Like, let's be realistic here. Uh, and the places that people will move to they're going to be places with infrastructure. So you might have some global, uh, some coastal towns or some nice little villages that people go to. But for the most part, most villages and small cities and towns will just disappear. And that momentum kind of grows because as the town empties out, you know, for young people, there's less and less employment, economic opportunities, less people to hang out with, uh, less marital options. Uh, so they move and accelerate the problem, right? So you can see a time in the future where pretty much everyone lives in these horrible capital cities, which uh, 
They're driven by the economy, both consumption and production. We all do both. Well, mainly we all do both. I might actually, uh, I might actually do a video on universal basic income. So I'm actually an economist by trade. I uh, worked for a private consulting firm as an economist. I worked in the government as, a con as an economist. I also worked as a university lecturer for several years as well as an economist. So I know a little bit about this stuff. When I say a little bit, I'm being modest. Obviously, I know way too much for my own good. But I might share a bit of this knowledge, or at least a perspective, because I, it scares me when I see some uh, public commentators who really don't know anything. It's really embarrassing. Even just then, I looked at a, a YouTube channel popped up called, I think it was Economics Explained, and they're saying, should we have a UBI? Will it affect inflation? And it's like, don't worry about inflation, mate. <laughs> worry about the fact that you give people money for nothing is that a lot of people won't work. And of course, to give people an endowment of cash, for you to have a balanced budget, you've got to tax the crap out of work. So you're going to go from, um, with your initial endowment, say you get whatever, $20,000 a year or something, to ever break even in terms of taxes, you have to tax them at a really high rate, maybe 50%. So if you're getting 20,000, if you're unskilled labor, and you're getting 20,000 a year, and then if you work, you're getting taxed for say 50%, and you might work for $12 an hour in a low end job in America, you're only getting $6. What the hell would you do that for? And of course, you've got to tax the very top a lot. And people at the very top are like, look, you know, because at the end of the day, the top 0.1%, they make your country, right? These self-made entrepreneurs, uh, mainly self-made, some's inherited. But these, these small percentage of people, they make our country, they make our economy. The rest of us just come along for the ride. We show up for work, right? Like someone here who works in a shop in Belarus, compared to someone who works in America in a shop, they're doing the same thing, mate. But in America, they're getting paid a real wage of maybe two and a half or three X times more because of the smart people in the country that have made the country and the economy very productive. So if you start punishing those people, and at the moment, you know, the, the, the fashion is to demonize these people. Um, if you demonize them, they might just take their money and go. We've gone through this before. We did this in the 60s and 70s. And we found stagflation was upon us. There, there are multiple things happening at that time, but a big part of it was you're just taxing people so much, they just stopped trying. And the tax rates, I know in Britain the tax rate got to 90% for the highest tax rate. That's a bloody lot, mate. You want someone to work and keep only 10% of it, what would they take the risk for? It's not worth it, you know? So you kind of got this backwards, dumb, dumb Marxist argument of rich are rich, poor are poor, but when you look at data showing income mobility across generations, indeed, your parents aren't that important. Oh, sorry, at least your parents' income's not that important. Obviously, they need to raise you well, raise you with a work ethic. If you've got some basic level of IQ, you'll do well. If you're not, don't have that, don't have a work ethic, well, then you're in trouble. But, yeah, even in America, we probably have the most enshrined wealth. Actually, income mobility is very high. It's surprising. I remember looking up this data, and I'm like, wow, actually, your parents don't matter that much. You know? It's not as if the top 1% sit in a room somewhere counting their money. I mean, this kind of, uh, it's really plays into people's inherent nature for jealousy without understanding how money is made how wealth is created it's very dangerous but it's very popular you know tell someone with no money that the rich person's exploiting them and uh, they should have more money and they'll get it from them well they're gonna vote for you right so you can kind of see I'm covering a lot of ground here <laughs> covering a lot of ground so you can see how these kind of socialist type policies which UBI is UBI is kind of socialist kind of policy you can see how these will just keep coming back generation after generation because um, they're so desirable for the masses and creates a narrative that is very politically desirable so you can just see this kind of socialism that will just keep coming back failing coming back failing coming back failing because do remember if you don't know this that during the Cold War when there was a lot of Soviet, oh, sorry, communist parties in control of countries around the world, 
Uh, the West also was quite communist. It wasn't perfectly communist, but tax rates were high. Uh, just the amount of regulation was incredibly high, you know. And then that's why people like uh, Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, um, that's why they were elected, because there was so much unemployment and there's no economic growth, high inflation, no growth, high unemployment. And that's why I think Ronald Reagan won like 49 of the states um, out of the 51, 52, whatever it is, uh, USA states. Incredible landslide. See, it's kind of, I feel like we're kind of doomed to repeat this cycle. As long as that kind of politics of envy and jealousy is there. Because it doesn't have to be, like it can be, a system can be what, you know, fairly objectively fair. But you can create a narrative saying that it's not fair, right? Anyway, my battery is about to die. So, nice chat today, guys. Um, let me know what you think. Give me a like. And uh, I'll see you shortly.